Hi, I'm Ed Robbins from Kent, and I'm here to talk to you really about type recovery. I'm, he I'm here to talk to you about type recovery. Oh, my microphone's turned off. It's okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> hi, I'm Ed Robbins from Kent, and I'm here to talk to you about some type recovery work, which actually ended up turning into some interesting work about decompilation. So type recovery is an emerging area, and there is another paper here at Popple, which I urge you to go and see tomorrow. Um, but historically, it has been somewhat makeshift and make do. So the leading commercial disassembler, Ida Pro, is able to do some type recovery, but it does this just by applying heuristics to assign simple types to local variables. There's a piece of work called rewards, which is a dynamic analysis and is able to recover types from a single execution trace, but it has a coverage issue because it says nothing about other traces. And there's some other work called tie, which is more systematic, but it doesn't relate its judgments to the semantics of the binary. And these pieces of work are also unable to deal with recursive types. So the fundamental question we were trying to answer is that we want the types that we recover to correspond to those of the source code. But the source is unavailable. So how can we state anything about the correctness of our recovered types? which is this question. So our answer to that is that we find a witness program in a type-safe high-level language, and we construct that such that its semantics coincide with those of the binary. And because this witness is type correct, we can then state that our recovered types have real meaning in terms of the binary. To, to look at a schematic overview of our work, we have two programming languages called Minx and Mints, we call them. MinX, or Minx, which is a minimal x86-like language, and MinC, which is a minimal C-like language. And we have this relation, which relates the recovered types and the Mints witness program to the Minx program. And what we're aiming for here and what we provide is strong guarantees about the validity of the recovered types. Because we show that the witness is type correct for these derived types. And we show that we have operational equivalents of the mints and minx programs in terms of memory consistency. So minx is an abstraction of x86. And in particular, orthogonal to what we're interested in is control flow recovery. And so we actually have something x86-like, which has functions. So here we see a function in Minx to do the iterative summation of a list, a linked list. And we can see that it has an argument, register 1, R1 and a return register, R0, and a local register, R2. And apart from that, we also have these labels for our blocks, .bb0, .bb1. The interesting part of this code is in .bb1, where we're actually manipulating the linked list type. So we're dereferencing R1, which is the first element of the linked list. And then two instructions forward, we're dereferencing the second element in the linked list, which is R1 plus 4. And this is the equivalent decompiled mince program. So immediately we see we have this linked list type. We have struct 1 as a definition at the beginning. And that has two fields. One is, has type long, and the other is the next pointer. Note that these don't have names, and if you look in at the accesses to these fields, 
in block B1, you'll see that we just access them by their, their, their position in the struct. So here is a representative snippet, really, of the semantics of a Minx program. What we're doing here is executing an instruction iota. We have our heap H and our registers R. And we have some previous sets of registers, R vector. And the instruction that we're going to decode is a dereference, again, of register RJ to place it into RI. And this is all fairly straightforward. We're simply updating RI in R by reading the value at RJ and looking that up in our heap. However, we do have to have some machinery to cope with the fact that we have a byte addressable heap and word-sized registers. So we have a, a mob. We're actually moving forming a mob of size w, which means we have to read w bytes from the heap and concatenate them, and then only update the first w bytes of ri. So to look at the syntax of mints programs, because they're a little more complicated, although not too much, we have a very simple type system with short and long. We have theta, which are the, the types that we can assign to program variables. So they can be short, long, or a pointer. And our pointers can point to our basic types, or to arrays, or to structs named, which are given by their name, n. In the normal way, we have statements, l vowels, and expressions. So we have assignment, ifs, if go to, go to, return. <coughs> variables, dereference, array and struct indexing, allocation and arithmetic. The semantics are a little more complicated because we have to carry around a lot of state. But here, we are looking at a mint's LVAL, and we're going to reduce it to an address. And we have to carry around our local variables row our old stack frames, row vector, our struct <coughs> definitions in sigma, our heap in small sigma, and for memory safety, our allocated memory ranges. Also note that mints programs can go wrong, so they can actually reduce to an error state. And here we're dereferencing, we're actually doing an array indexing. We're looking up E in X, so we, we will first evaluate E to get a value. We then check that X is not null. We can then calculate the address that we're looking for using the offset V. And then we have to check in pi that our address is in an inside an allocated memory range. Here we have our decompiler relation. Again, we have some state. So in this rule, we're, we're relating an instruction iota to a statement, an assignment. And we have our state mu gamma, which is, relates our minx registers to our mint variables. We have a typing context for mint, which is gamma c, and our struct definitions. I'm going to show you three different ways to, to decompile this instruction that are present in our relation. So it's the, it's the dereference mov, which we had two slides ago. And in the first instance, we can see that we're decompiling this to a simple dereference. And we have said that ri is x and rj is y inside mu gamma. And that the types of x and y are theta 1 and a pointer 2, a theta 2. We then have some subtyping relation on theta 2 and theta 1, and we have to state that the sizes are the same. The second possibility 
is that we are actually indexing the first element of an array. And in this case, we've just changed the, the uh, type of Y. The final case is that we're indexing the first element of a struct. And in this case, we have that, the, that Y has the type of a struct N pointer. And we have, to, we have the definition of the struct N in sigma, which is a list of types theta 0 to theta N minus 1. And then we have the subtyping relationship on the first element. We have to deal with some problems with memory granularity because mince variables and heap have no explicit sizes. So the stride between consecutive array and struct elements is always one. Whereas minx has word size registers and a byte addressable heap. So the strides between elements and fields in arrays and structs depend upon the size of those elements and fields. So we have to account for these differences. And as an example, in rules such as this one, this is a rule for relating subtraction or addition in minx, so that's what the op there represents. We have this constraint c equals m times size of theta, where we're converting a minx stride of c, which includes the, the uh, sizes of the elements, to a stride m, and we have this constraint that relates them depending on the size of the actual type. This might seem quite trivial, but it has a much deeper effect in the proofs, where we have to show that the memories remain in sync at each execution step in lockstep. Now, so far, I've talked about a relation. Um, and the nice thing about it is that, as we basically have horn clauses, we can turn that into an implementation quite straightforwardly to take our decompiler relation into a decompiler. So we've, we wanted to test this. So we built, built our decompiler with, with CHR, essentially, very straightforward. We, we then needed some Minx programs to test with, so we've built a compiler that can compile C into Minx. And we can then translate Mints back into C. It's essentially a C subset. So we can then take our original C program and build it with GCC. We have a Minx interpreter, so we can compare the execution of our compiled C program and our Minx program. We have a type checker for Mints to ensure that we really are type safe. And we can then compile our final program as well and check that the execution again is the same. So we have done this for a bunch of textbook programs. And these are all programs which manipulate data structures because we're interested in type recovery. So here you see some idea of the size of the programs. And we have the number of solutions. The next column shows us the number of struct definitions in the original program. We've then got the number of struct definitions in the decompiled program. Because we have multiple solutions, we can have different numbers of struct definitions in our decompiled, it, well, in, in different solutions. So for example, with hash sep, we have four solutions, and they have six, five, six, and five struct definitions in them, respectively. In general, we can also have less struct definitions than in the original program. So for example, in bin heap, we have our second solution has one struct definition where our original program only had two, actually had two. And the reasons for this is that arrays in general are interchangeable with homogeneous structs, so structs where every field has the same type. And also because in, unreachna un in unreachable parts of the program, we will actually derive a struct for that single part of the program, but we can't, we can't say that that struct is the same as a struct in another part of the program, so we end up with two definitions. 
The important message from these results, though, is that for every witness program, we have, for every benchmark, we have one witness whose recovered types are identical to those of the original modulo renaming. Every solution has types compatible with the original in the sense that arrays are compatible with homogeneous structs. And every recursive type in the original appears in every single solution. So we have shown how to derive types from an executable that have true semantic meaning. And apart from this, we've also built a type-based decompiler. We've evaluated this, and for every benchmark, recovered the original types. Looking to the future, we would like to machine verify our proofs. And we'd also like to extend this to work over x86 binaries directly. There's also a shameless plug on screen if you'd like to come and join our lab. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a question if uh, you had multiple types of same size, how would this theory be extensible? So it doesn't just use um, size information to determine which types are which. It can actually um, determine which types are which through their use. Through other instructions in the uh, MinX? Yes, yeah, so if you wanted to extend this, say, to deal with signed and unsigned integers, you can find artifacts in x86 code which indicate that something is signed or not. Okay. So you may have said this, but I didn't quite catch it. In your table, you had multiple different numbers of types for the same input, for the same... That's right. And so is... Is your tool non-deterministic in that sense? Yes. Or is that from different versions? Or okay. So yes, it can in general find multiple solutions. Okay. Also, it may not actually find a solution necessarily. Yeah. So, um, just to answer that question, because we've um, translated our decompilation relation into Horn clauses where the control is controlled by constraint handling rules, we're able to systematically enumerate all the different solutions. So we don't just non-deterministically find one solution, we're able to systematically enumerate all solutions. Do you have any hope of extending this to handle unions? Yeah. Um, I don't know if we will have to have some kind of limitations about that, but we have some ideas for extending it to handle unions and also arbitrary casts. Um, whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. Um, so it depends how compatible the types are. Um, but I think actually you can extend it to handle any cast, um, but you then have an unsatisfiable system, so you have to attempt to solve it and then find what's the, uh, what's the maximum set of constraints that you can satisfy to identify where the cast is. Thanks. So in a sense, this tool could be used to, to discover implicit structures in the code, maybe not written as such by the original programmer, but maybe it's optimization or kind of uh, prefactoring. I'm sorry? The, the tool is actually could be used to recover the implicit structure in the code, which might be not be marked as such as original developer. For example, several variables you, you always use in conjunction. Yes, you can actually. So you could 
It may be that the original programmer used um, address arithmetic instead of using structs or arrays, and we would, since we don't support arbitrary arrest, uh, address arithmetic, we would recover data types in this case. So that what you recover could be even higher level than the source code? Than the original, yes, that's right. Um, I think you can contrive that example, but um, simply, simply through stuff that we don't support yet, um, or, or through casting, for example. But I mean, in general, in, inside of the, the, the kind of constraints of what we've defined for our Minx language, no, I don't think so. Uh, 